Welcome to this YouTube channel. We are Bibleway Temple International, an apostolic church situated in the Mova Lavantil community, located in the beautiful Twin Island Republic state of Trinidad and Tobago. Our mandate is to touch and transform lives by being good stewards, sharing the message of Jesus Christ. And today, it is a pleasure to share this message with you. We invite you to praise and worship with us as we proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord over our lives. Hallelujah. More than the blessings and the breakthrough, we want you. Amen. We want you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Bless his holy name. You may be seated in his presence. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Glory. That's, that's hallelujah and glory all in one. <laughs> Amen. But it's good to be back here again with you. Uh, it was really a good time the last time we spent in his presence and we're seeing growth and it's good to have connection to see for the first time my dear brother Gildin. Uh, your pastor is making some great connections for me and I thank God for that. Amen. Meeting some other great men of God and connecting us together and it's about networking it's about making divine connection even right here before we go to heaven amen it's such a great thing to meet some of your brethren that you never know because we're all family amen. you know as I look around this church you can always uh, whenever you go to any church you you observe you know you observe the spiritual atmosphere and I could count the men and it's almost half of the congregation. Now, that is an indication. I look at the mix of the ages and you're seeing middle-aged people. It's not easy to get middle-aged people because they're into their career. They're at the height and the zenith of their career. They're doing their doctorate. Uh, they're, 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 they're working eight to four. And then they, they, on weekends, they, they're doing their studies or they have a little side business. And then at night, they're mining forex and cryptocurrency. And they have no time for God. But we, we, we're seeing all the different ages represented here. And that's an indication that this church is a church that is alive. Amen. Amen. Yeah, there's a church in Toko. It's empty. No, nobody goes there anymore. The aged population died out. And they never met the next generation. There was only one time it was spoken of in the Bible where the children of Israel obeyed God. And that was in the Joshua generation. And those who outlived him. And the very next generation in Judges chapter 1, it says... And there arose a generation that knew not God or the things that he did in the wilderness. Just one generation it would take. So we have to reach them. Amen? It's good to be here in God's presence. What's happening in the world today? <laughs> Donald Trump. I'm beginning to think there is something mystical about this guy. I wasn't too into the, you know, oh, Donald Trump is our man because we know that salvation and deliverance doesn't come from the East or the West. There were days when people believed in politics and we believed that if you vote for PNM, it will go well with the church. We used to believe those things. Or if you vote for UNC, there will be certain favors that will come to you and we realize, boy, we're just about on our own. But what is happening in the world, in America? I think there are two reasons why they hate this guy. He, he, he doesn't like gays. He's, he's conservative concerning that. 
and he supports Israel. Wow. Whoever is a friend of Israel is a friend of God. Keep your eye on what's happening in the Middle East. There is a war that is going to involve the entire world. And it starts right there. And guess what? We know how it is going to end. And we know who is on the right side. Hallelujah. The Bible says, in the last days, I will give the world an ensign. I'll raise up Israel as a banner. That's what an ensign is to the world. And I'll be saying, yoo I'm writing a story with them. Because Jesus said, they will be trampled down of the Gentiles until. Do you see them being trampled down of the Gentiles? Seven million people fighting against 400 million Arabs. And they can't beat them. He says, in the last days, I'll make them a burdensome stone, and all who try to move them will be cut to pieces, and I'll make the governors of Israel like a heart of fire, and those surrounding nations, they will burn them like a torch. That's Benjamin Netanyahu. He isn't letting up. There's no two-state solution. I heard one minister say, oh, thank God, you know, Trinidad believe in the two-state solution. No, there's no two-state. For heaven's sake, they don't own Galilee. Jesus was born in Galilee. Hello. <laughs> That's the biblical heartland. There is no two-state solution. All of the land belongs to Israel. How could they be occupiers? How could they be colonizers? When we read a book of which for the past 50 years, four billion copies have been sold. It's a bestseller. If it's not taken off the shelf from year to year, no other book will make it as a bestseller. And you're reading these places in Judea and Samaria, which is the West Bank, and you're saying two states? Something is happening down in Jabal today and God is in charge. Moses said it. Elijah said it. Isaiah said it. Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Read it. All the prophecies. They said there's coming a time that I'm going to draw you back from the nations from whence I've scattered you. And you will build the old waste places. The place that were ruined. Wherein people pass and shake their head as in a Bible and say, wherefore did these people came to this situation? And he would say, you know why? Because they disobeyed the Lord. He says, but prophesy to these mountains and say to the mountains, I'll cause men to come upon you. He says, I'll make the desert, uh, I'll make it a wild, I'll make it into a blossom like the, like the Garden of Eden again. That's what God said. He says, and I will bring all nations against you. Everybody hate Israel right now. And you say, but okay, you know, they're, 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 they're in disobedience to God. When have they ever been in obedience in the wilderness, during the period of the judges, during the time of the kings, during the time Jesus was there, they were never ever. But you see, God says, I'm not doing it for your sake. When have we ever really been obedient to God? He said, I'm not doing it for your sake. He says, but I had a friend named Abraham. <laughs> he says, and I give you this piece of land for your offspring. Not for now, but forever. As an inheritance eternally. You can't move them. The land belongs to them. And so what is happening in Israel? God is in charge. A lot of libel, a lot of... They didn't, they didn't steal no land. They came and they bought the land. Okay. And the Arabs didn't like the two-state solution when they came and celebrated independence. The Arabs attacked them first. In the War of Independence, in the Yom Kippur War. Keep reading it. The Arabs always attack first. Because you see, it was a Jew that killed Muhammad. When he invaded Israel, he took a man's wife, a Jewish man's wife, and she poisoned him. They don't like Jews. They have ethnically cleansed them from all of the Arab nations. They're no more. They cleanse them. Do you know more Jews since October 7 have come to the nation of Israel than before because they don't feel safe anywhere? 
because they were comfortable and God says, I said, I will draw them out in the, in the valley of, of, of the valley of dry bones. He says, this is the whole house of Israel. I will bring them again. Moses says that you'll be scattered, but from the furthest ends of the earth, there I will bring you back. And when I bring you back, he says, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, come, let us break their bands asunder and let us cast away their cords from among us. He who sits in the heavens will laugh <laughs> when I put my king on this prophecy now, that's Psalm 2. It says the nations are confederate saying, come, let us remove and obliterate that the nation of Israel be no more in remembrance. That's what they say. The Lord will have them in derision. Be wise, therefore now, ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Kiss the sun. Least he be angry and you perish. God is on Israel's side. He who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. Amen. So pray for Israel because God is, God says those who pray for Israel, those who are a friend of Israel, they'll be blessed. I bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you regardless of if they were disobedient. There is a blessing. Many nations, when they proposed the two-state solution in Britain, shortly thereafter, the monarchy fell. God said, I'll curse those who curse you. And God is raising them up like never before. They're, they're the most powerful force to reckon with in the Middle East. Amen? So pray for them. Pray for the Gazans too because 99%, there are only a thousand Christians on that island. 99%. Remember Moses prayed, Lord, if we find a certain amount of people, you'll spare them. It could be judgment. 99% with a construct in their mind that Israel must be obliterated. They don't want a two-state. They want a state absent Israel. That's what they really want. But we're stamping. Gaze for Palestine. Really? They throw gaze off the roof and eat them for breakfast in Palestine. So you're just shooting your foot by representing Palestine as a gay. But the world is twisted and today the morality is not about right and wrong again anymore pastor. It's about the victim narrative. If you are a victim you are on the side of right. If you are the victor you're on the side of wrong. People don't like authority. People don't like right. People don't like structure. People don't like order. Every sordid, twisted lifestyle is now exonerated and is coming to the forefront. We are living in the end times. When he said right will be called wrong and wrong will be called right. Anybody who is suffering, the gays, they're minority. They're suffering. They're the victim. Oh, so they bring a case to the forefront. And every sordid minority, this is how the world's morality is now. Once you have a cause and you're suffering for a cause, oh, they came and they destroyed my lab during COVID and this and that happened. I'm a victim and everybody comes on to that victim narrative. And it doesn't matter if this minority is screaming for all the wrong reasons. They are a victim therefore they are right. So many atrocities, millions of people in Yemen and in, in, in Africa and these Muslims people, see, see how they treat their own self. Iraq and Iran, one point something million dead. Huh? Bashar al-Assad, civil rivalry, 600,000 of his own people slaughtered. But they're crying for the Gazans. Oh, it's sad, but they don't really like each other. They just hate Israel more. <laughs> hey, I didn't come to preach that. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis Chapter 37. All found say amen. It's all about be the obedience this evening. It's not an option. It's a... Let me hear you. It's an order. People don't like orders, you know. People don't like you to tell them what to do. 
So we're looking at Genesis chapter 37. Some people don't read the words, so I'll, I'll read all of it. Amen. That's all right. I, I, I'm going to read all of it. Amen. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding his flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was a son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream and told his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For, behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheave arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, Shall thou indeed reign over us? And shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed yet more, a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and his brethren. And his father rebuked him. But the father didn't rebuke him the first time. But now that the father is involved, all right? He said, I will bow down to you and your mother. He says, uh-uh. What's going on here? But he tucked it away in his, in his heart and observed the scene. Verse 11 of Genesis chapter 37. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem. Now Shechem was a place where, uh, what was their, their daughter's, his daughter's name was, uh, I can't remember his daughter, but she went and strayed. Huh? Zina, Dina, Dina, yeah, Dana, Dina, yeah. And she strayed and some uh, tribal king caught her and he raped her. And, and, and then he wanted to marry her because he loved her. And the brothers say, well, okay, your people like my people. And they say, you all will be circumcised just like us. And while they, they were recovering, they fell upon them and killed everybody. And we kind of like this story, but Joseph didn't because he wanted to settle down. He didn't want to make no enemies. I mean, Jacob, he didn't want to make no enemies. So he didn't like the thing. So they're down in Shechem. He said, go and check out your brothers because you see them, them just get themselves in trouble. And he said, go, I pray thee, and see whether they, thy bre where, if it is well with your brethren. Well... And, and if it is well with the flock, and so on. And bring word again. So he sent him out uh, of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him and said, What are you doing wandering around here? Who is you? Who are you looking for? And he said, I seek my brethren. I pray you tell me where they are. And he said, They were feeding the flock. He says, Here's what. They went down to Dothan. All right? And so Joseph went. We're in verse 17. Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, you know, there's those, those people who have this distinctive way about them, the way they walk, you can make them out in the dark, you can make them out from afar, right? They say, aha, look this dreamer, behold this dreamer cometh. Come now, let us slay him and cast him into a pit and say, some evil beast had devoured him and we shall see what will become. Of those dreams. And Reuben heard it and delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, uh, Don't shed blood, but cast him into a pit in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him, you know, that he might later on come and deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass that when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped him of his coat, the coat that had many colors, and they took him. And they cast him into a pit that was empty. It had no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread and lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, God sent help. A company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead. And they had camels bearing spices and balms and myrrh. 
going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said, came up with a brilliant plan. He said to his brethren, what profit if we slay our brother, you know, and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to these Ishmaelites and let not our hands be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh and our brethren. And the brethren were content. And they passed by the Midianite merchants. And they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. And Reuben returned to the pit or unto the pit. And behold, Joseph was not in the pit. And he rent his clothes. And he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not. And I, whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid. And they used the, the blood from the, 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 the kid and they, they dipped the coat in it. And they sent the coat of many colors. They sent it unto their father. Uh, verse 32. This have we found, they told him. And know now whether it be the coat of your son. And he knew it and said, it is my son's coat. An evil beast had devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his, father's, his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, and the captain of the guard. Hallelujah. Whoa, what a story. What a story. Today we're looking at obedience and faithfulness in adversity. You see, it's one thing to be faithful when conditions are favorable. <laughs> but how do you respond in obedience to God and faithfulness in adversity. Heroes of ancient stories are often portrayed to be everything we would want to be strong and powerful, perfect, without weakness. But biblical history is not written this way. The heroes of the Bible are portrayed at their weakest as thieves and liars immoral people going through pain and suffering, suffering great loss, so that God remains the ultimate hero of the story who uses a myriad of circumstances to accomplish his objectives. Now, there are some attributes of God we would never see when we enter into glory. They are only evident in our brokenness. We'll never see God as a healer ever again for all of eternity. There'll be no need for it. We'll never see him as a redeemer, as a miracle worker in terms of brokenness. We'll never see him perform certain acts ever again. We only see God in these ways while we're here on earth. And someone say, to live here down below with the people that you know. <laughs> it says to live up above with the people that you love. That would be in glory, <laughs> you know. But to live here down below with these people that you know, that's a different story. <laughs> Truth. So Joseph plays a pivotal role in the redemptive history. You see, the Bible is not just dry, dead history. One of the reasons why a book is not counted as the word of God, it is because God has not have his divine spark in it. If God isn't doing or saying anything, it's just history. This is why this book says, because it gives people hope. History is usually written from the perspective of the conqueror. We came, we saw, we conquered, we were powerful, we ruled, we reigned. But the Bible is not written like that. It gives us hope. That's why people keep buying it. And that's why they put down the history book after they got the A's and they don't pick it up no more. Because there is no hope in Alexander the Great conquering the world for us. 
There is no morality in these history books. This is why the Bible continues to perpetually be relative to us no matter what time and space because the stories jump out at us. And so Joseph plays this pivotal role and there are some examples that we can learn that he can teach us. And so I wish to use him as a launching pad to set the tone for obedience that is not an option, but it is mandatory. Obedience in our brokenness. Obedience in adversity. Obedience when conditions are not favorable. And so in order to fully understand uh, the scenario, we need to look at the backdrop. You know, preachers like to give you a scenario of what is happening and not just bring the story in isolation. Yeah, Joseph came from a less than functional family. He came from a kind of dysfunctional, extended, polygamous family. There are some strengths in an extended family. You know, respect for the elderly, uh, help with chores. You know, you can go off and study and leave the children with grandma, you know. And there is a social support kind of system in, in an extended family. But then there are some disadvantages. You marry a woman and she has to conceal all of her dislikes, you know, because the wider family doesn't agree. And so there is a lot of disagreements. You're married and your brother is still wearing your clothes that she bought for you and... Those are the kind, everybody's sharing everybody's stuff kind of thing. And in a modern world, that, it has some complications with that, you know. You even have all these different characters, ca characters or characteristics coming out of the different family. You have the hero, the good child who, who went to QRC and everybody, you know, they exonerate him. He did well. Oh, this is the hero of the family. And then you would have the mascot, which is the person that would usually diffuse tension. He's always joking around and clonging around and creating lighter moods, you know, then you had the black sheep. This is the only person that made jail in the family and you're like, you know, he's just so different from everybody. Why is, why, why is Sheldon so different from, why you can't be like all the other brothers? Why you can't be like your brothers? You have all these characteristics. Then you have the enabler, the brother who, or the mother who picking up for everybody, you know. Nah, the boy not so bad, nah. You don't worry. He looking like if he don't see now, but he got surprise all all you. He got surprise all all you. You know, you have the enabler, child who getting away with all kinds of things. And they're just living in denial. So his father Jacob came from a less perfect family as well. With a mother, Rebecca, who was a kind of take charge kind of person. You notice that? That when, uh, I mean, Isaac was a kind of sap. He, he was really a kind of sap. Listen, let me tell you something. He was born to be that way. Your father carry up the mountain telling you he going and sacrifice something. It had no animals around. Then he tie you down and you just deal like a willing sacrifice. Well, if he want to kill me, is, uh, you know, that I'm a father, you know. As he bring me in the world, is all right, you know. And then he go, he get big now and he gone in a community and he dig a well and, he, and, and the people rise up and say, that we well. And he say, well, all right, take it. He go and he dig an next well, so he was a real, and when it's time for him to get a wife, his father had to send a servant to go get a wife. What kind of fella this was, boy? He even, he even nearly anointed the wrong person. He nearly anointed the wrong person, you know, as the heir. He wanted it to be uh, Isaac, and he wanted it to be um, Esau instead, because Esau would have represented what he was not. Esau was a man of war. But God said, no, nah, Esau wasn't the man. And he wanted to give it to Esau. He liked him. He said, boy, this fella is all that I wish I was. I wish I could have stand up for myself. Was a hunter, a rugged man. He wanted to be like that. And again, the mother, Rebecca, she was a kind of take charge. She uh, worked up some schemes with Jacob to ensure that, nah, nah, uh, he had to get the blessing. And of course, they paid the ultimate price. You see, if God bless you, it doesn't matter. 
you are blessed. You don't have to work schemes. But they went and worked schemes. And, and he, 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 he faced that law of reciprocity. Whatever you do, going to come back to you. Some people call it karma and all kinds of things. And so he's there with his Uncle Laban. And Uncle Laban make him work hard for small money. Make him work seven years for a woman, boy. And then the next seven years, 14 years for one woman. And, and you, know what, you know what the Bible makes sure and mention? Some little things that we overlook. Laban the Syrian. The Syrian people just make you work for small money, boy. They're still doing that, boy? <laughs> but, what? What in the world is going on? People don't change, boy, after centuries. They're still making you work hard for small money? Any Syrians in the house? So between the exodus from Laban to going into the land of Canaan, God met him. He had an encounter with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he struggled with God all night. You see, that's why they can't destroy Israel. Because his name was changed from a deceiver to Israel. He who struggled with God and prevail. You could try to kill a man who fights with God and win. You can't kill a man like that. That's why they can't kill them. Because God's word is settled. And so he, he was in this polygamous relationship uh, with Leah and Rachel, and which yielded, and, and, and their two concubines, which yielded the 12 sons of Jacob. Now, a further commentary on the dysfunctionality of this family would see Reuben go up to his father's concubine and had a child with her or had a relation with her, incest in the family. Then you had Judah. Judah went and he chose the Canaanites. Now the Canaanites came from Ham. Those were the people that Noah had cursed. The black people also came from Ham, but it did not curse the Egyptians and the, uh, the, 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 the other um, like it would call the Nubians and so on, who went to Africa. It was only Canaan. People falsely acclaimed that he cursed the black race. He didn't curse Ham. He cursed Canaan. Cursed be Canaan. And later on he says, your brethren will have what? To me, the upper hand over you. And that's how they obliterated the Canaanites. But you see, it's not a racist thing because look at this. He goes and he marries a Canaanite woman. He said, oh, Canaanite woman, sweet too bad boy. And he went and he got one for his son, Ur. And Ur was so wicked, God killed him. So he gave him to Onan. And Onan said, I'm not raising up no children. So when he had, they had the, the, the bedroom scene, he, he did not uh, give her any children. And God killed him too. So he had one more son. He said, but the fella green, right? He's a green lizard right now. When he get a little older, I'll give him to you. And as time went on, she's looking and realized, boy, I am the doghouse boy. You know, he's old enough. You know, uh, he's strong enough. And, and I ain't here ain't nothing. What is going on here? And they put her in the doghouse because he's thinking to himself, boy, it's just one more, you know. This woman is a black widow, you know. Every son I give, she turn up dead. I'm not so sure I want to do it a third time. Come on. He's, he's reasoning that in his head, you know. Uh, he's lost two sons on an account of this woman. So he ain't going there, right? And he's trying to buy time to see what could happen. And one day, he goes off to a missionary trip. <laughs> he goes off to a missionary trip. And he passes by one of those places of irrepute, Villa Capri or, or, or Das Dan or, or, or Spanish Harlem. You all wouldn't know about them places, right? Where I work, they just talk about it. You shouldn't know, right? And Double Palm and them, right? So he, he, he passes by one of these places and he meets this beautiful woman. He goes in unto her and boy, it was so good. But he had no money, you know? He, he had no money. He said, girl, I had no money to get what I do. So he gives her his signet and his ring and and his bracelet and all his personal belongings. He said, when I come back, I'll give you a kid of the goat. He returns and people say, that kind of thing don't go on down here. You know, we don't know what you're talking about. You probably walking through the desert and was hallucinating and saw stuff. Right? And so time begin to lapse. And then the morning sickness and the swollen ankles and the vomiting and so on. And they say, aha, your daughter-in-law is found with child. And he sought the opportunity to slay her. 
And she called the family together. She said, come. Who ID card is this? <laughs> Who social security card is this? And then she produced twins. He would not have carried on the legacy of Judah had that sordid situation took place. And then Jesus became the lion of the tribe of Judah, a union between the Canaanites and the Shemites. In the midst of adversity, in the midst of your mistakes, God is still going to accomplish his purposes. You better believe it. And God took this dysfunctional family and he says, this I'm going to make a great nation. Hallelujah. I'm going to reveal to the world through this dysfunctional situation. Really? Does God know what he's doing? We often ask these questions. When you look at the disciples that Jesus chose, Judas, a thief, to balance the books and be the treasurer. Does, does, does Jesus really know? He wants to form an organization that will transform the world for centuries to come. And he picked fishermen. The last time I could remember, fishing is a nice trade, but it didn't require any kind of university. It didn't, the kind of stuff that would change the world and conquer people. I, I, I can't remember. And then you had Thomas, uh, the sons of thunder, saying, Lord, when you're reaching the kingdom, put me on the left, put me on the right. The worst thing you could have is people in an organization fighting for power. And as soon as the older folks see the younger folks, going and doing the degree. They get frightened because they know they're ready to replace me and his problem. So you know with your old self you don't see like the back of a spoon. You can't study no more and you and you're trying to see if you could get a little fast degree some little online some because they go take your position. And Jesus chose this group and he say, I'm going to transform the world. <laughs> they sat where you are sitting so that you can sit and God can do with you the great things that he did with them. And so, this is the situation we find ourselves in. But there are three things that the Bible makes note that we can look at in the life of Joseph. He was favored by his father. He was faithful and obedient. And he was forgiven. So let's look at it. He was favored. Jacob of all persons should know that favoritism breeds what? Hmm. Contempt in the family. And so it started with this rivalry between Jacob and his two sons uh, and the concubines. He loved him more, as a matter of fact, he loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. Now, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 21. Here's what it says. It says there are three things. Okay, no, I forget. I've forgotten four. There are four things. That's how the Bible puts it with poetry. That the world, you know, that, that causes trouble in the earth. Hear them. A slave who became a king. That's one. A fool who have everything they need. That's, that's two. Right? And a servant girl who becomes ruler over the woman she serves. And fourth, a woman whose husband hated her but still marry her. For whatever reasons. Could you imagine Leah day after day knowing that she was not? That's why God said one man for one woman. Them thing is confusion in her. Them thing is confusion. And this is the situation. So Joseph was like the hero, treated like the one responsible for the well-being of others. You know, and Reuben was like the black sheep, went up to his father's concubine. Jacob was the enabler, you know. Letting him do whatever he wanted around the house. And this was a situation that he found himself in. And every attempt to console their father, it failed. I could imagine these boys saying, watch out this man crying for this one son. But I wonder if any one of us had died, he would have carried on so. Secondly, he became faithful. He's not just favored, but he became faithful. Meanwhile, Joseph's pain could not be more accurately described than utterly humiliating. The pride of the family, the hero, has now become 
the slave to the seed of a bond woman of his great grandfather, the Ishmaelites. That's who Hagar had Ishmael. Now he's serving Ishmael. He's a servant to him. And so when Joseph arrived, they sold him to Potiphar's house. And here's what Genesis chapter 39 verse 2 said. That they sold him. He became a slave. It says, and the Lord was with Joseph. What? Where was God when his father was treating him good? Where was God when his father ill-treated him? It made no mention of God being with him. Where was God when he was in the pit? Where was God when his father was crying? His father is a prophet. Why didn't God tell him? Where is God in difficulty? We pray and we fast and no answer. We cannot understand the turmoil that we're going through. That's why at funerals, I try not to say much to people because you could put your foot in your mouth. You don't know where people are at when they lose their loved one. You think, well, the man was a drunkard and, the, and you're saying, girl, God, finally take that man off your hand. But, but <laughs> she loved him. She liked the licks too. It was part of him paying attention to her. You don't know where people are. And so where is God when his father was grieving? Where is God in my brokenness? Where is God when I lose my job? Where is God when life hurts? And I'd say he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And the master and all saw that the Lord was with this boy. And he wanted to keep him. He said, the hand of God on him. And here's what the Bible says. It says, and Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. Pay attention to that. He served him. We need to serve. Let me tell you something. The most of the problems I have found within churches, not this church. I haven't found that in this church. You see the musicians, the worship leaders, and the song system people, they give the most trouble. Not in this church. In any, they try to hijack the pastor often. They feel they have a trump card. Things can't go on without me. And especially when worship leaders here, we've come to the most important part of our service. After they had people moving, and then they watch the pastor and people sleeping. They say, Really? Be careful because who was the worship leader in heaven? Ooh, ooh. <laughs> He didn't like the worship God was getting. He didn't like the attention God was getting. So be careful that the Lord don't use you in these areas. It said what? He served. And he made him overseer over his house. And it came to pass that from time to time that he was over everything except what? The food that he ate and his wife. Duh. And God blessed the Egyptian house for him. And it says Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. Everybody liked the boy. He was favored. But he was also faithful and obedient to his master. And life seemed to be starting over for Joseph. Things weren't so bad. People like him. He didn't have that when he was with his brothers. You, listen, sometimes you grow up and you say, boy, them people was just, uh, I just happened to be born in that family. Yeah? Because my brothers and them some kind of characters unsavory. Uh, I'm not with them anymore. And you want to disown some of the people that you were born with. So he was probably well happy to be with this new family and life was starting over again. Except it had one little problem. Potiphar's wife. She's like one of those women in the movie Desperate Housewives. She walking around with all kind of skimpy things. Eh, you could imagine Joseph cleaning. Listen, ladies, let me tell you something. There are some women, they are teasers. They won't go with nobody. They, they're not going with nobody. And Shadow saying, when you're young and you're pretty, you want to show off your beauty. But when you get old and simple, you're answering anybody. Eh, listen, I could bet you anything. I can bet you anything, I can start a conversation anywhere with a woman uh, at least over 55. Anywhere, as a stranger. Say, hi, how you doing, sister? You okay? And they'll get a smile at them. 
but she's still under 50. But it's not so different with others. It's not so similar. But when they're 30, hi, how are you doing, sister? I say, John. Because they're young. They're young now. Give them some time. When they pass by the corner and the young fellas stop calling them. <laughs> yeah. And then people start to call them Tanti. Tanti, I look like your Tanti. <laughs> I look like your Tanti to you. They're going down. I drive in there and a guy say, Hey, papi, 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 park your car here. I said, Papi, you know I could come out and do this to you? <laughs> papi! But that's how they're seeing you. I went to buy something with my son and the, the jeans fit my so good. I said, Josh, tell them the same guy, the red skin guy, came, that came uh, and bought the blue jeans, uh, say to give you one. And so they went, they said, guy, guy. He said, yeah, my father, him. Oh, old school, eh? Hey, old school, sonny son. Said, that was... Because, yeah. And so she's parading herself. But Joseph makes it his duty. If he see her coming through one door, he go through the next door to avoid her like the coronavirus. <laughs> but one day, she cornered him. She cornered him. Couldn't get away. No way to pass. No door between them. And it's the, for the second time, his coat was taken. When his master heard it, he was so angry with this woman. I think so. Because Joseph should have been dead. Why did he keep him alive? Come on, man. You know your wives. Come on, woman. You know your husband. You know. As they say, the old people say, don't look with candle in the night what you could see in the day. <laughs> And when the heart on fire, smoke in your eye, you can't see false. But you know, you know. Bone to bone, what kind of person you're dealing with. And so he puts him in the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed everything to Joseph's hands. And here's what the Bible says in chapter 20, in verse 21. It says, but the Lord was with Joseph. <laughs> In the prison. Why is God showing up in our greatest pain? <laughs> and gave him favor in the sight of the prison. God is near to those who have a broken heart. Hmm. And sometimes he keeps us in brokenness so that we will draw near to him in obedience. That job you lost, God is just setting you up for greater things. Amen, somebody. And the keeper of the prison committed him to everything. So he became the orderly in prison. You know, with Pastor Parks, we used to go, I, I think you went to Carrera too with him, and, and you would see the orderly. You would see them in prison, snatting their nose. I said, who is that guy? They said, that was the child killer. And he's like, -ba 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 -ba. he's a Christian now. Perhaps until he come out. You see, the devil have no use for them when they're in there. So they're convicted. But when they come out, now they have to deal with their psychic demons all over again. So he became the orderly in prison. And he was faithful as an inmate. Everywhere he was, he was faithful. In every situation, the Bible makes note to say he was faithful. And during this time of the two prisoners, uh, he took care. The Bible says he took care of them. One was the butler and the other was the baker. And so Moses makes a very interesting comment about Joseph's relationship with these two men. He says, and the captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them and he took care of them. Took care of them. The important thing to see here is that Joseph really did serve those two men. He must have sat day in, day out and say, I didn't do it right when my father put me in charge. When pastor put me in charge of the music and in charge of worship, I use it as an instrument to get leverage on others. And so the pastor say, uh, uh, he have a special service, but I remember 
what he doing, man. I remember what he did, man. Pastor, I can't make it out tonight, boy. I can't. But we don't have no other drummer, boy. We don't have no other keyboardist. People come in. Patrick Manning's son will be here. How are you going to not play? The Bible says he served. He served. He served them. He served with willingness. This is where he had failed before with his brothers. He used his position to trump over them. But he's getting it right, people. He's getting it right. He didn't use his leadership as an occasion to destroy and lord it over. But he's getting it right. And so one morning, the butler and the baker get up. They're confused. They had dreams. They're talking about it. And this is where his life begins to transition to greatness. See, when you serve in the pit <laughs> and you serve in the prison, when you're a nobody and you're faithful, God will raise you up. Amen, somebody. And so they had dreams. And he interpreted their dreams. The butler was the king's cupbearer. The baker, well, he would bake. But the baker, his dream was not favorable. So Joseph didn't bother to tell him anything. But he realized that the butler would meet Pharaoh again. You ever met a politician or someone important and you say, oh boy, I'm looking for a house long time now, you know, and things really hard. I'm looking for a job for my two sons. And you think that they will care? Joseph told the butler, he says, when you reach the Pharaoh, put in a good word for me now. Tell him. He says, I went through some stuff with my brothers. Don't think that Joseph went to sleep every night. We don't know what reverberating against the background of some people's mind. They come out and they smile. But when they have to face the music home and the wound get blue and it's hard and you're wrestling in your sleep, that's what was going on with him. He remembered it vividly. And he says, some stuff happened to me, boy. When you reach the Pharaoh, talk to him for me. I know I have potential to be greater than where I am. And the butler forgot all about him for two full years until Pharaoh had dreams. <laughs> Pharaoh had two dreams. Nobody could interpret Pharaoh's dreams. He said, I do remember my faults this day. <laughs> there is a boy, a young man in the prisons. He know about this stuff. And Joseph was chosen. He was the man. And he was exonerated. There was a kind of dual effect in Joseph's life. Things happened twice. In, in, an, in an unusual way. Scripture is really divine. And if you dig between the details, you'll find so much more than just on the surface. A lot of things happen twice. His father, Jacob, was the sibling of just two. It was just two of them. He married two wives and two concubines. The, his mother only had, which is Rachel, had two sons himself and Benjamin. His brothers hated him for two things, his father's love and his dreams. He had how many dreams? Two dreams. When his brothers sold him, they sold him for what? 20 pieces of silver, a multiple of two. It took 22 years before they met him again, another multiple of two. Twice his coat was taken from him. When he was, uh, they threw him in the pit and when Potiphar's wife took it from him. Twice he was in a pit experience. Twice he was second in charge. Potiphar's uh, uh, in Potiphar's house, and to Pharaoh, he was second in charge. Twice he met his brothers and sent them back. Twice he cried. Twice they bowed down to him to fulfill the dream. He had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, making him to forget and multiply. Everything was twice. Pharaoh had two dreams. He had two uh, uh, people in the prison, the butler and the baker. They and all had dreams, two of them. This, there was just a confirmation of who this man was. 
God will authenticate your ministry. Everything about your life is scripted. You better believe it. Even the bad parts. They asked Joyce Meyer, <laughs> Joyce Meyer, what would you change from your life? And she says nothing because the good and the bad and the mixture and the myriad of everything is what made me who I am. I would change nothing. Joseph was faithful and obedient. He had one more test to be the hero among the 12 patriarchs. Would he forgive his brothers? <laughs> Will he be forgiven? And so chapter 42 and following sets the scene for Joseph's reunion with his brothers. It is approximately 22 years now from the time that they sold him into slavery. And he's about to meet those scoundrels. His brother arrived two years into the famine. Of course, we know the story. There was a famine. It was predicted. He told Pharaoh what to do to prepare for the famine and so on. And he says, boy, you know what to do. You interpret this dream and time is ready for you to be exonerated. So he was in charge. When his brothers arrive in the famine, he goes through a thought out plan to get confession, repentance, reconciliation, not revenge. I want us to understand he was not seeking revenge. He's a clever man now. He understands even the conclusion when he says, you all meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He knew that because of the position that he was in. So he was not seeking revenge. He had no need to kill them, but he, was, he didn't know where they were at. And so he's putting them through a test. And so at this time, the most kept secret in Gibraltar is about to be exposed. The father don't know. All that time, them boys keeping that secret. You ever kept a secret from your wife and the thing is eating you away? And all your life is guarded around that secret. You're living your life twisted. You will not prosper. You could fool man, but you can't fool God. So he goes through false accusation, imprisonment, handling favoritism again, and the law of reciprocity. Whatever you do will eventually come back to you again. So he accuses them falsely of thieves. He roughs them up. And everything about this man reminds them of Joseph. So they begin to rehearse. They say, you see, I tell you, we wasn't supposed to treat the young boy like that. And he's standing by and he's listening. He says, remember the boy crying and saying, let me out. And we're hearing his screams and we wouldn't do it. Today is a day of reckoning for us. You see what's happening for us? Nothing is going good because we didn't treat the boy good. And Joseph's standing there and he weeps. They don't know he could understand and he could hear them. But he pulls himself together and he says, look, listen, you all are spies. Tell me what's going on. He gets information from them. He finds out his father is alive. He says, yes, I'll go work this plan now. But I could deal with these contrails. Let me see where they're at. It's 20 years and they are recalling and rehashing the incidents with vivid recall. It was deep-seated in the family. Something ever happened in the family that you will never, ever forget. It was a secret. It may come out later on, but you won't forget it. Those wounds go deep. There are some wounds that go so deep they never heal. He bounds Simeon, imprisonment now, eh? They're going through all that he went through. He bounds Simeon and he says, don't bring back, ben, don't come back unless you have Benjamin, which is his brother. Now he knows his father would love him as the replacement. I want to see my real brother. Don't come back. They go back to the father, say, boy, we meet this man, we, we blurt out and tell him everything. Say, God, I'm fed up, tell him, stop telling people outside your business, your family business. And so he say, you all want to make me childless. Everything is against me. Everything is against me. And they're eating day one, day two. The barrel getting low. They're watching each other. <laughs> we had to carry Benjamin. <laughs> Benjamin goes down with them the second time. So when they see him the second time, confessions started to come out because remember, the, the money was in the sack. He put back all the money in the sack. They started to bring out confession now, but he's still roughing them up. He says, prepare them a nice meal. And they're like, what? This looked like the meal before execution. Everybody's, everybody's around. And they say, so he comes and he serves them. 
imagine that from the eldest to the youngest, they say, what kind of man, this man, this man different, how does this man know who is the eldest? And he's now giving Benjamin five times more than all of them. Favoritism. How you, ah, doesn't feel too good now, does it? <laughs> how you all handling favoritism? I'm not going to hide that I know this is the boy's father. How you all handling it now? And he's watching them. He's watching them. And as they get up to leave, he gives his servant instructions. He said, put all the money in the bag and my special cup. And then you would chase them down and accuse them of stealing it. Bring them back here. The one who steal it, put it in the youngest one. I want my closest brother next to me again. Because he's crying, eh? He's seeing his youngest brother and he's crying. Hmm. They bring spices and balm and myrrh thinking it will impress him. Guess what? Those are the very things he keeps smelling when he was going down to Egypt when they sell him as a slave in a caravan of spices and balm and myrrh. He don't want that. <laughs> and they bring it here. Look, look, smell it. It's nice. <laughs> you don't want that. You're reminding me. You ever try to make amends between somebody and you say and do all the wrong things and make things worse? You wish you just didn't say anything. The smell of those things but just bring back memories. But Joseph only had eyes for his brother. So he gave these instructions. And when the servant came and met them, he said, oh, let's take the master's cup. They say, eh, no, we ain't take nothing. He says, but here's what, the man who take it, so they begin to overreact. The man who take it, kill him. And all of we will be a slave. First, they're so sure. You ever was in a roadblock, police stop here, but you, 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 you're late for work or something, and you're like, come to this dumb police boy, you know, and, and you're bad, you're bad. And then, when you open your documents, you realize your driver's license expire, your knees start to get weak, <laughs> you want to beg for mercy now. <laughs> you ain't so bold no more. That's what happened to them when they realized all their money there. But I guess Benjamin found out something was going on. He said, what can I say, my Lord? We're guilty. How can we clear ourselves? God has exposed the sin of your servants. We are now your Lord's slaves. We are your possession. Whoever took the cup and we will be a slave. He says, oh no, I just want one of you all. Just Benjamin. The rest of you ain't worth nothing. <laughs> Go home to our father and just leave him right here. And Judah's answer is most interesting and encouraging. I am convinced that Judah knew that they didn't steal those things. Something was afoot here. But they realized it was a day of reckoning. They, they say something happening to us here in an unnatural way. We're we, we innocent. We know that. He knew it. We're innocent, but something is happening. And they saw it as the day of reckoning. And so he told Pharaoh, he says, we not steal this money, you know. We ain't really steal it. He says, but, he says, but God has exposed the servants of your people this day. God have exposed it. I don't think Judah meant that we stole the money or the cup. But he says, he exposed our sins. We sold our brother into slavery some years ago. Something you wouldn't know and we wouldn't want to get into all that. But God has exposed the sin of all of us today. Something you won't know. And so we will become your servants. He says, no, just you alone. This was real progress. But he needed something more from them. Something more. Look at it right here. He's narrowing it down. He says, I only want the favorite son. I only want the favorite son. And they say, listen, Judah stands up and he puts on a stellar performance that moved Joseph to the core of his bowels. He couldn't take it anymore. He said, listen, we are the 12 sons of the patriarch. We've lost a son before. And this son here is the favorite of his son. We don't have no, of his father. We don't have no problem with that anymore. We understand that. We have come of age. If we don't carry him back, his father will die in his old age. We are the sons of a promise, of a great nation. Let this boy go! He tells Pharaoh that, but he's frightened and shaking in his boots. And Joseph puts out everybody and he begins to cry. Couldn't take it no more. He begins to cry. There's some wounds that go real deep in you know, a boy. 
every time, it's years now, but every time you think about it, you still feel the pain like it was yesterday. And there is an emotional atmosphere. And I can imagine they're sitting and they're looking at the king, the most powerful man, crying and weeping before them. And their jaws drop. And on top of that, he says, I am your brother who you think was dead. No! What kind of witchcraft is this? He says, but settle in your hearts. You taught it for evil. Hallelujah. But I understand my pain and all that I went through. And I was obedient in the midst of all of my struggles and adversity. And God has brought me out for this purpose. Satan could not. You thought it was for evil. And let me tell you something. The Bible says the wrath of man praises God. And he restrains the rest of the wrath. Even evil will be used to reflect certain characteristics of God. And every time Satan is Satan knows he's going to lose, you know, but he keeps raging attacks. Had the princes of this world known what Jesus would have done on the cross, they would not have crucified him. Satan thought he was destroying the seed, but he was to come forth in prophecy hidden and tucked inside the scripture that this was the purpose to die for the sins of the world. That's why the Jews miss it. In the scriptures, they search and they think they have salvation, but they didn't understand. You see, that's why we keep prophesying. Do you know that every single prophecy that the church has predicted concerning the coming of Christ, they've been wrong, <laughs> every single one, and we keep doing it. And the world keeps saying we are jokers. Leave it alone, leave it alone. Jesus said no man knows the day nor the hour. Just say these are signs of his coming. It's drawing there. Let's unite Let's reach the loss. Let's preach the word. Let's keep the unity in the bond of peace. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You see, there are some things that forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not forgetting. When you forgive someone, the memory isn't suddenly wiped clean. You still remember that offense. There's some things men will forget, like their wife anniversary and their birthday. And men will forget those things. But you see when people do you wrong? <laughs> you have it down to the minute. Neither is it regaining automatic trust. You do not immediately gain trust with the person. Somebody came and stole. Somebody hurt you in a particular... You won't trust them. It, that trust has to be earned again. So Joseph didn't just ignore the offense and say, hey guys, I'm Joseph, I forgive you all. No, he carried them through a process. You see, this was divine. The man had wisdom. And that is what God is doing with us. He's carrying us through a process. He's processing us through everything that we are facing. And so he quickly encouraged them. He says, my father's still alive. Bring him down. Joseph is reunited with his son. What a moment. 70 souls come down. And from there, God incubated them. Made the nation disdain them so they would stay together and not go marry the Canaanites again. And blur their whole vision of who they are as a distinct people in the earth. And that's why people hate them. Anti-Semitism takes on all different forms. At one time, they hated them because of their race. At one time, they hated them because of their religion. Now they hated them because they are in the land and they're successful. Tom a soul was asked, why does so many people hate the Jews? It says, because they have prospered. It says, how can we help in making the world not hate us? He says, fail. Just fail and they will not hate you anymore. <laughs> Just fail. People will hate you when you succeed. But when you go through your struggles, God will exalt you. The hidden wisdom of God, which he had ordained before the world unto glory. There's some things that God hides and he keeps. And so he quarantined them. God's favor is upon us through his son Jesus. And if we would be faithful and be obedient and walk in his ways, God will exalt us. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us today. Please like and share this video. 
If you need prayer or counseling, feel free to call us at 680-7111 or WhatsApp us at 754-4270. Someone is ready and waiting to pray and speak with you. If you desire to make a financial contribution, you can make a direct deposit to our Scotiabank checking account, Bibleway Temple, account number 1200176, transit number 90035. On behalf of the leadership of this ministry, Apostle Celestin and Mother Europol, we say thank you and we look forward to having you fellowship with us another Sunday. 